Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series that we launched in 2020 with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these SALT Talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And both of our guests today uh, are two people in the investment world that are shaping the future through their pioneering work in the field of ESG. So we're very excited to bring you this episode. ESG investing has become a huge part of the investment mandates of institutions that we work with uh, on SALT and that come to our conferences and, and tune into our SALT talk. So it's a very relevant conversation, as I think we'll find out uh, from the dialogue that we have today. Uh, with Anthony. So our two guests are Erica Karp and John Stroyer. I'll read you a little bit about their bios before I turn it over to Anthony. Uh, Erica Karp founded Cornerstone Capital Group to bring the disciplines of finance and economics together in pursuit of a more regenerative and inclusive form of capitalism. She's a Wall Street veteran of 25 plus years, and she developed a deep belief in ESG analysis as a critical input to investment decision making over the course of her career. Now, prior to launching Cornerstone, Erica was a managing director and the head of global sector research at UBS's investment bank. She chaired the Global Investment Review Committee, served on the UBS Securities Research Executive Committee, and served on the Environmental and Human Rights Committee of the UBS Group Executive Board. Erica holds an MBA in finance from Columbia University here in New York and a bachelor's in economics from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she recently recently joined the board of directors of Conscious Capitalism as well. I know she works with a variety of different organizations, ranging from the UN to the Clinton Foundation, on a variety of, of uh, ESG and sustainable finance initiatives. Uh, John Stroyer is the president and chief executive officer for Calvert Research and Management, a wholly owned uh, subsidiary of Eaton Vance Management, specializing in responsible and sustainable investing across global capital markets. John is also president and trustee of Calvert Funds, as well as a board director of Calvert Impact Capital and chair of its audit and finance committee. Uh, John began his career in the investment management industry in 1987. Before joining Calvert Research and Management, he was president and CEO uh, with Calvert Investments. He's a founding member of the Investor Advisory Group for Sustainable Accounting Standards Board, SASB, and a group of leading asset managers uh, committed to improving the quality and comparability of sustainability-related disclosure by corporations for use by investors. He's also one of the eight members of the Leadership Council of the Impact-Weighted Global Accounts Initiative. Uh, so I think these are two guests that I think better than any guests we could have on SALT Talks will be able to give us the lay of the land across ESG, impact, and sustainable uh, finance investing. John earned his bachelor's from the University of Wisconsin College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Uh, so thank you both for joining us here today. Hosting our talk is Anthony Scaramucci, the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, a global alternative investment firm. He's also the chairman of SALT. And if you've been watching SALT Talks, he, he needs no introduction. And without further ado, I'll kick it over to you, Anthony, to conduct the interview. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm still mad at John Darcy for telling John and Erica that I failed the bar exam because I was out water skiing in Manhasset Bay. So that wasn't a nice thing to do. Okay, I'm trying to build I always a good, have to bring up one or two trying to build a good in, first impression past. with these people and you got to fire that in there to make me lose some of my confidence in this interview, you know, because I'm obviously a little shy and introverted. So let's start with you, Erica. Uh, tell us about your background. Why did you become so passionate about impact-oriented investing? You know, so, so I came to sustainability and impact in a really organic way. You know, I believe that, you know, all investing has impact, right? And so when you look at the environmental, social and governance factors in an analytical way, uh, you realize that this is really important to be a good investor. You know, when you think about revenues and costs and risk, you need to think about ESG factors. So as a director of research, I'm just trying to push people to kind of earn the right to make an investment call. Tell me what you know that nobody else knows. And so when you go down there and you try to find out what matters, 
around ESG factors, it's first of all, endlessly fascinating. Secondly, it gives you serious predictive insight. Thirdly, you start to realize that you can combine your investments with your values. And so, you know, I got there in a way that's really very organic. It's not about ideology. It is about values and it is about pragmatism. Uh, Same question for you, John. I think the um, investing business is a a business about understanding change, understanding what's changing around us and understanding how companies are likely to navigate that change. So for us, ESG investing is about understanding a company's management of critical functions and factors that allow us as investors to do two things understand how they're managing these risks that are changing and evolving, but also to participate and help drive positive change. A big part of what we do at Calvert is engage with corporate management to try to get them to improve their operations in ways that address these critical environmental and social risk factors. So that concept, Anthony, to really be involved in innovation helping to improve the system uh, that we all participate in and drive positive change that relates to financial value creation really brings together all of the best elements of investing and participating in these capital markets. Are we doing enough? And what, what, what I mean by that, when I sit back and I look at the landscape of where we are as a society, where we are in the environment, uh, we have a group of people that are in the ESG world, but should the whole world be in the ESG world, I guess is what I'm saying. I mean, are, are we doing enough? And if we're not doing enough, how do we do more? And that's a question for both of you. So I'll start with Erica first, and then, John, you can respond and add on. So the answer is no, we're not doing enough. Um, but part of it is because we need this massive consciousness raising exercise, right? So I said that all investments have impact. It's a question of knowing, is it positive or negative and what is it? So if you have to understand kind of the magnitude of what we need to be doing, I mean, just think about climate, right? So if maybe over the past year, uh, $500 billion was invested in alternative energies, right? Well, we actually need that number to be about 1.5 trillion if we're going to get anywhere near where we want to be. And we think about these other big initiatives towards water and energy and infrastructure, education, broadband. We need billions, something like seven, uh, excuse me, trillions, something like seven trillion to move to have the kind of impact we need. That said, there is some consciousness, but it hasn't come to the mainstream yet. It's starting but we need to move a lot more money a lot faster. Um, So there's certain things that we need like infrastructure, like standards uh, for disclosure, like leveraging AI, leveraging social media. So there is this this fierce urgency of of now that hasn't been infused into the economy yet. Um, I think we're making progress though. Yeah, I agree, Eric. Uh, we're not doing enough. Um, wh- what is it? What is enough, and how is this really going to play out? So far, we're relying entirely on market-based solutions. Of course, we believe in market-based solutions, particularly in the United States. Um, so we're following the playbook that we've used, uh, particularly since the 1980s. What can be done to change that dynamic, and and what are the things that are needed in order for us to do enough? Um, a carbon tax, a price on carbon at the right level um, would facilitate an even a more aggressive response uh, from the market. Uh, Erica mentioned regulatory. We haven't yet built the market infrastructure to facilitate Anthony doing enough, um, but we're not far from it. Uh, I think it's uh, very encouraging to think about the fact that we're doing what we're doing without regulatory help without having built the necessary infrastructure and without having put a tax or a price on carbon. So what we're experiencing right now is something that is led by investors, as I said earlier, completely market-based. If we can make a few policy adjustments, which I think most people in the capitalist system want to see made, I do believe that will 
uh, allow us to continue to operate within market-based solutions and significantly accelerate it. And I would just add one element, which is inequality. Um, we are operating way below our potential because of the massive financial and other inequalities in our system. If we can begin to address that um, also through these solutions, I think we can improve the lives of literally billions of people across the board. Um, so in addition to the environmental concerns, the um, inequality issues are significant. So I, I just started reading this, uh, which is uh, Bill Gates's new book on how to avoid a climate disaster. And so I guess my, my question to both of you, again, same sort of question is, Mr. Gates is obviously a brilliant guy. The book is very well written. There's a lot of practical solutions in here. Um, but we seem to have lots of forks in our roads in terms of going towards a more sustainable climate environment, more ESG, if you will. And I think some of the critics of Mr. Gates would say, well, he's got a portfolio of homes that's second to none, very large in scale, a fleet of private planes. He owns the Four Seasons Hotel Complex, among other things. Uh, is he the right guy to be writing about climate change? And so then the question is, what do we do? Uh, do we sit in a small room that has uh, uh, solar panels on the top of it? Um, how do you how do you reconcile billionaires that are writing about climate change that are flying around on private planes, et cetera? What do you say to people? So I, I got to tell you, I have no issue with this because there is no such thing as perfection. Everything is on a scale of, you know, good, not good, whatever. We don't have to be judgmental. And what I would say is if we can bring transparency and an honest dialogue to this, we're fine. It's okay to have your toys, as it were, but it's better to be, you know, transparent. Talk about your toys and figure out how we can get your toys to be better. Right. And so what we really no, need. But Eric, I mean, should I be living like Teddy Kaczynski? You remember the Unabomber in like a small shack somewhere you don't in the middle of to. nowhere, not using that much energy, having an outhouse? You really don't have to. All right. Again, I go back to this issue of transparency. There's a lot of stuff that people don't realize that we have to get get out there. First, um, there's a this stupid notion that using ESG analysis um, is in some way giving you um, concessionary returns. False. Two, the notion that ESG analysis is uh, against a fiduciary duty. Totally false, right? Three, that you have to be a purist. That is not the case either if we're trying to move kind of the, 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 the quantum of the capital markets, right? So we can, you know, have our lifestyles, try not to be judgmental, ideological, but let's make progress. And the single most important thing we need to understand, not that this is simple, but we have to have systems change. Everything relies on everything else. We can't get to climate if we don't talk about uh, women's economic empowerment. We can't talk about uh, broadband unless we talk about uh, data privacy and human rights. We can't talk about, you know, one of these sustainable development goals that the UN has put out without talking about the complexity and the interrelationships. So this is complex. There's no such thing as perfection. Transparency should allow us to be non-judgmental and have system change to get, for instance, to a circular economy one day where there won't even be a concept of waste. And by the way, I should tell you, I am a little bit of a nihilist. So in terms of a climate crisis, unfortunately, we're already there. There's a lot of bad stuff that's already baked in. That doesn't mean, you know, we will wipe out, you know, humanity, uh, probably, but um, there's a lot of work to do. Yeah, I, I, um, if you don't mind, Anthony, I, I would um, take a little different position. I don't think Bill Gates is the guy who's going to solve climate change. Uh, I think it would be better if the Bill Gates and even the Anthony um, DiCaprio's of the world stop, stop talking about it. Um, it's not about what an individual says or does, and it really doesn't matter what you do with your air travel and those types of things. Um, so getting the liberal left out of the picture, stop talking about it. 
this is a policy issue. We need to move a few big levers and create the uh, financial incentives for the free markets to solve the problem. As I said earlier, price on carbon would go a very, very long way to giving us something for entrepreneurs and innovators to compete against. It's policymakers right now that are needed more than you know, rich, famous people talking about the problem and telling us about their, their pet solution. So I think uh, I'm gonna stop there. Uh, I've got another book for you, by the way. I see you're in your library. The New Climate War by Michael Mann came out about the same time as Gates' book. He's a professor, I'm not getting the kind of publicity that Gates is getting. Be more consistent with my thinking. All right, well, we'll, meet, we'll get him on a salt talk. I'd love, love, love to meet him, love to talk to him. It'll also force me to read the book. Uh, we, we, I will point out that we did invite Mr. Gates on a salt talk, but, you know, because I have a little bit of a roguish personality, I'm somewhat unpredictable. I would say that the chances of him coming on a salt talk are 0.0, but one can hope. But let's continue on this because I think this is important for me. And I'll start with you, John. Are corporations stepping up to the plate and adopting better ESG frameworks, John, or is it lip service? I think there's a little bit of both. Um, so I think companies for a long time at the operational level have paid quite a bit of attention to how they use resources, operational efficiency, but it's all been based on economics. Um, so to the extent that fossil fuels have been cheaper than renewables, those are the decisions they've made to the extent that it was much more profitable to pursue a product line or service that had negative impact on the environment. That's what they've, they've pursued. Um, that's a very, very slow change to, uh, to think about happening. So while companies are providing us more information about how they're managing these very risky activities, um, and they are doing a better job of managing those, they're not really making the big changes needed to protect the environment and to create a better, more sustainable future for, for all of us. So Anthony, it's a little bit of both. They're doing a much better job managing these risks, but they're still involved in a big, big way and actual change is very slow to come. Is it a drop in a bucket, er Erica, or do you um, think it's? I think it's more than a drop in the bucket and there's certain pieces of, of infrastructure that we've needed to help. So I was um, a, a, a founding board member of the SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. And that is about having, you know, trying to get standards for corporate disclosure of material ESG factors. That That is very helpful, but setting standards take a long time. But again, getting good data, comparable and projectable data um, is an important thing because that goes into uh, the ratings and the indices and then the products that are created. So we have a long way, not a drop in the bucket, but it's helpful. And then what you're starting to see is that the leading corporations are figuring out how to truly um, um, change or adopt their business models around ESG issues. They are starting to align compensation around ESG issues. They are starting to ask questions that are specific to industries, to companies around the risks and reward opportunities. So you ask different questions of, let's say, a hotel or an airline industry um, than you ask of a, um, a mining uh, or shipping company or a, you know, a technology company. So understanding how to zero in on what matters, what is material, is really critical. And in fact, there's been some good research. Uh, uh, George Seraphim, as an example, um, put out a piece that talked about um, the fact that companies who give us data on issues around sustainability that are not material to their economic outcomes actually underperform rather than not putting any data out whatsoever. So we want companies to report on the stuff that matters. Um, and, and again, it's, it's still early days, um, but it's, it is more than a drop in the bucket. So, so John, last year, uh, we saw, according to the Financial Times, this is not my information, but I read it in the Financial Times, a 17% reduction in carbon emissions. And, you know, you'll correct me if that's accurate or not, but that's what I read. Uh, 
is that sustainable? Uh, obviously, well, it came from the pandemic. Uh, are we smarter now? Or are we working more efficiently? Or are we going to be on our Air- Airbus 380s the minute the pandemic breaks and traveling around the world? Uh, is there anything that the world's learned from the pandemic that can make our societies more sustainable and more energy efficient? Well, I certainly think the pandemic makes very real these risks, right? So we all know that really bad things can happen if we don't attend to risks associated with all of these behaviors. And certainly the, uh, the storm in Texas and what happened with the Texas grid, um, it just makes it very, very real and we can see it happening. Um, so I do think it, it, it does make a difference, but the carbon reduction number is simply because of the economic slowdown due to the pandemic. And as soon as things bounce back, um, those numbers will go right back up. And as we bring hundreds of millions of people online into the industrial society in China and India, those energy systems are still primarily driven by coal and fossil fuel. Even though they're also deploying a lot of renewables, you know, the, the, the concept of bringing all these people out of poverty and into the industrial society, we can't change the energy system fast enough with the current policies to keep up with that growth in the uh, industrialized world. So drop in the bucket, those numbers will bounce right back um, and we haven't done nearly enough. So Erica, I've got you in charge of everything. Okay, you you look like somebody that would like to be in charge of everything, as do I, by the way. So that's not a it's not an attack, it's just an observation. And so now you're the czar. And uh, let's go with what John is saying about public policy. And uh, I've already ordered the book, New Climate War by Michael. How do you say his last name? Mark? Man. Man? Michael yeah. Mann. Okay, so I just, I just, I use my Amazon, which is going to burn up uh, cardboard now, and they're going to start their engines, and they're going to have that book to me tomorrow. I'm going to open up the cardboard and plastic and throw it in the garbage. And I'm going to have the book sitting here next to these other books. And because it's about the climate and I'm Catholic and feeling guilty about my consumption, I'll be reading it. But you're now the czar of all of this. And so go ahead. What are we doing from a policy perspective to move people towards what you and John are doing? Hi. Well, um, big question. And um, I definitely don't run stuff anymore. I'll give you a little headline. Cornerstone is going to be merging with Pathstone. Uh, so that's a new headline for you. John, you're smiling. I'm glad. Congratulations. But in any case, were I to be running stuff, I think John is right. First, carbon price. You know, I think that that comes first. It's the biggest um, it's the biggest impact we can have initially. Um, secondly, you know, I talk about a more regenerative and inclusive economy. That inclusiveness critically important because the kind of income inequality and wealth inequality we have is growth killing, right? So that inclusiveness is key. What I would do, and coincidentally what we have done uh, at Cornerstone Pathstone, is that we've created a framework where we think about the idea of access, all right? So a single common denominator to get to these huge global challenges I would argue is access, right? So the whole world needs access to clean energy, to water, to education, healthcare, capital. Um, Access is where it's at. So I think what we have to do, if we're gonna use the private sector, so we're gonna have for policy, we're gonna have um, uh, carbon pricing. Uh, For the private sector, we're gonna have disclosure. And particularly, we're gonna start thinking about what is a company doing to give access to the system? So SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals, number 17, is about um, uh, collaboration. And I think that's what's so critical. So companies need to understand what's their contribution, what is the true cost of of what they're creating, i.e. those externalities um, that that they're giving out. And by the way, I don't know how we're going to answer this one, and it's partly why I am... I know I list, but if the um, if the emerging world has consumption patterns that are like the Western world, honestly, I don't think there's anything we can do to recover from that. Um, meaning, you know, is humanity kind of not long for this planet? Honestly, it's possible. 
Um, but I think those are the couple of things we can do to get public sector, private sector um, moving forward. Uh, John, are you as pessimistic? Well, um, probably not as, I don't know about pessimistic, but um, you know, the incentive that got us here is money. Um, and I think the incentive that'll get us out of this is money plus data. So there's two things I would do. Uh, yes, I'd, I'd put a global carbon tax on things and I'd allow it to escalate and use that tool, which is just an amazingly powerful tool um, to create change at the pace we need to see change and work within the system we've got. The second tool that I think is going to become more powerful than money is data information. Um, and we need to, and we are doing it. And this is the other piece that's changing that I think can facilitate the kind of change we need at the speed we need. Check out Impact Weighted Accounts Initiative. We're running it out of Harvard Business School. Seraphim is, uh, is overseeing the project. Sir Ronnie Cohn, great venture cap player out of the UK, is a senior advisor to the project. I'm advisor to it. We're creating the data needed to understand the impact so that we can have information that's investor useful and can sit next to the data on the income statement and people can understand the trades they need to make to work within this incentive system. So, you know, I don't think we're gonna get there without using the same incentive tools that got us where we are, the profit motive. That's why we need the carbon tax. Second, we need to understand how powerful information is becoming, and we need to use that to the full extent. I think, Erica, that's the only way we're going to deal with it, given what you observed, um, Asia and the rest of the world coming into the you know, industrial, ultimately, they're going to want the same things that everybody else has, and they deserve them, right? We need to be able to adjust the energy system so we can do all that, let those everybody in the world have access and, and do it in a way that won't destroy the planet. We need the we need the capital incentive and we need the data. All right. Well, I have to I have to invite my colleague John Dorsey into the conversation because uh, we've got too many baby boomers in this conversation. Yeah, so baby boomers. We got to bring that next generation. Us baby boomers have had a frat party with the with the world. We now want the millennials to live on Sunday morning in that frat house with the bong smell and the, the beer stained rugs and so forth. So go ahead, young millennial, fire away at these baby boomers that are destroying your planet. Yeah, you guys are always talking trash about, you know, millennials and Gen Z, but we're the ones that have to clean up your mess. You're exactly right. Thank you for, for being self-aware about that fact, Anthony. Oh but, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the E. We've talked a lot about environmental. That's only one third of the puzzle if you're talking about ESG. I want to talk about the S for a second. And obviously in the wake of the George Floyd murder, uh, we had sort of an explosion in awareness about the systemic racism that exists in our society. And there's been you know, more corporate engagement on ways that we can sort of root out the systemic nature of that racism. You know, the, the idea that we're going to eradicate racism is probably a fool's errand, but we can do more to chip away at sort of the cycle uh, of racism, racism that is, exists in our society. But I want to start with you, Erica, on, on the, the S piece of it. So what are companies doing or what can they do to uh, address issues related to racism and discrimination in our society? Uh, where, do you think, where do you see things heading? Are you optimistic about that? And, and what can we do in addition? Actually, I am optimistic about this. I'm optimistic about kind of social justice, generally speaking, and that goes to the consciousness issues. So whether it's gender, whether it's race, um, these are critically important for 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 productivity um, and and even beyond the, the moral issue. It's a, it's a it's a functional issue in business. But the thing about um, racial equity, I think we have to start by acknowledging. Um, you know, that, that white privilege is something that most of us don't think enough about. You know, face it, 
America was built on white supremacy to some degree. So we really have to start thinking about, okay, what is that? Who am I? What do I want to be? And arguably moving towards kind of a, you know, a, a truly multicultural, thoughtful organization, let's talk about companies, is a continuum. You know, it starts with organizations that you can see are flat out racist. And then it moves to an organization more of kind of compliance, right? And then it moves towards an organization that is a learning and accepting entity. And then it moves towards a place where you really have, you know, everyone in at the table in terms of decision making and positions of authority and that's how you move organizations forward it's a continuum and the idea of accelerating that continuum now i think is is very encouraging what's going on and so for instance we will do um, pieces of of investment research on investing um, for racial equity and you really can move your money in such a way that you are accelerating uh, that continuum so so I am uh, quite optimistic about progress, but it starts with a consciousness. And I think that, you know, George Floyd's murder in front of our eyes, you know, I really think it was a pivotal moment um, that of, of, of self-reflection. Um, so I am positive on what we can do here. Um, and again, it goes from racial equity and gender equity and not even thinking about gender as, as women's economic empowerment, but it's but it's, you know, all genders, um, LGBTQI, all of it. Um, and then when it comes to um, issues of education and healthcare and all kind of people of color in the, in the BIPOC world, what's happened with COVID shines an incredibly powerful light on the impact of, um, uh, of to everyone, much, uh, much um, greater disproportionate impact of people of color. So thank God we're a learning um, society, or at least I hope we are. John, so I want to go to you on that one. I've, I've seen you speak and write very empathetically about just the human side of the issues that Erica just spoke about. And I think we all want to make sure that, you know, we have a level of equality in our country where people feel like they have access to the same uh, you know, American dream that everybody else does. But from a practical perspective, you've talked a lot about market forces and how do we communicate to people uh, about you know, the importance of investing in diverse teams and investing in companies uh, that are going to drive that diversity. So from a practical basis, how does how do diverse boards and diverse organizations drive better returns? Is that a, is that a fact that's backed up by empirical data? And, so. and, and what type of companies can help drive that change as well? Yeah, that's backed by empirical data. Uh, we've, at, by the way, at Calvert, I want to tell you what we're doing and what we've done since um, that terrible day uh, in May. Um, we, we said we'd do something about it. We've gone after the 100 largest companies in the United States, and we've asked them to disclose their EEO1 survey data. This is the demographic information about who has what job within that company, what level, and uh, gender and race. This is information that these companies have to provide to the EEOC, but they take great pains to keep secret. You can't even get it with a FOIA request. So we've asked these companies to disclose it. So as investors, we wanna know the answer to your question. Which of these companies have diverse teams? Which of these companies have created a workplace where black people, women, people of color can have jobs throughout the organization? We need the data. Uh, we think we've got about half of the companies agreeing um, to release that data and make that public. That's a first step. Let's get transparency. Let's get the data out there so investors can see it. And people who want to work at great companies who create a diverse workforce know where they are. They know what's happening. I think we have filed about um, up to, I'm going to say, 20 shareholder resolutions ready to go to proxy against these teams. Um, I think we've been able to successfully negotiate agreements with about half of the companies we have filed on as they've also now agreed to disclose this information. So I think you have to take action to make management and boards aware of how serious we are, how important this um, information is to everybody, investors and employees. But I think, I think that action is useful, it's helpful. 
You asked about, um, you know, does a diverse team, is there a case to say a diverse team is better, makes better decisions? Let's just build the business case for this. In the U.S., white males have actually been declining in terms of the percentage of the overall workforce. Women are increasing, people of color are increasing in terms of the percentage of the workforce. So if you're an employer, you need to be able to create a great work environment so you can work across the entire labor market. Additionally, educational attainment by women and by people of color across the board is increasing. Um, so your highly skilled portion of the labor pool is becoming more diverse. Running a company, if you're only good at putting white males into senior management positions and that all you can do, you're actually not that good. We want management teams that can create a great work environment, get the best out of all people and participate across the board. And yes, getting different points of view, hearing different voices really works. Look at Calvert, 56% women, over 50% people of color, doing well against our investments across the world. We invest in emerging markets, developed markets, equity and debt, great track record. We've got a diverse team and we've also done the research to show that across large companies globally, diversity works and, is, is, and really matters. So a lot to say there, John, appreciate the question. Um, things are changing, but we've got to really push these companies hard uh, and we need it as investors, right? This is about driving value. This is about improving companies, getting them to adjust to what's changing. Our demographics are changing. Companies are dragging their heels in terms of building the processes. And I just want to close on a really important point. People matter more than ever. Um, book value doesn't matter. Um, what matters today, this is a, an idea economy. We've heard it, we know it. We've transitioned from industrial manufacturing to intellectual capital and ideas. That's all about people and bringing the right people together to make it happen really differentiates companies. So super important point all the way around. Thank you for that, John. It's very well said. I think that's one of the unique characteristics of both Calvert uh, and Eric Cornerstone and everything you've done throughout your career is being able to apply these principles that can be somewhat subjective or amorphous uh, on the surface, but really digging down and quantifying the benefit. Eric, when you talk to people about the return benefits of ESG, uh, how do you think about that at Cornerstone? Well, I mean, we, again, we're very pragmatic. So if you look at the research, and, you know, we did a meta study of like 1,200 other studies. But when you look at the research um, in integrating ESG factors into analysis, it is unequivocal that you do either as well or, frankly, better uh, with companies over the long term when you're looking for uh, the key factors in ESG. So the, the research is unequivocal. And think about it. Why would you not want more information rather than less? Right. So what we do like to see uh, for our part is um, we like to make sure that our asset managers are analyzing companies as deeply as they should be understanding the intersectionality. So it really does take a skilled manager to integrate those ESG factors. And, and again, it's not easy. And there's a lot of bad data out there still. So any single ESG factor is not enough to make an investment decision upon, right? Okay. You take a factor, an ESG factor or rating, anything else, it's a starting point for inquiry. But again, all the research shows, um, and it's a little different across different asset classes, but it's pretty unequivocal that you can do better with ESG analysis. Now, what's really interesting is that in some quarters in the past, um, it has been seen as kind of a risk mitigation strategy. That's just simply not the case. That said, we have seen sustainable strategies outperform in down markets. But if we look at what's been going on in the past year, we've actually seen ESG strategies, so-called, outperforming in the up markets too, right? And so in our view, um, sustainability um, is a proxy for, for quality, for good governance, for innovation, and for resilience. 
And that's actually how we've seen these companies and these managers perform recently. And again, innovation and the way the market is so bifurcated now in terms of what performs well and what doesn't, right? Innovation is so critical. So we argue that sustainability is, again, a proxy for that. And by the way, I should say that in the E and the S and the G, that G, governance, is first among equals. If a company is not analyzing the impact of the E and the S on themselves, well, they're not well governed by definition. And so when we do this analysis, the manager selection and diligence, you know, it is a really critical kind of holistic effort. And just because a manager labels themselves as sustainable or impact, that's not what we're looking for at all. all In right. fact, um, it's quite the opposite because about 91% of the products that are called sustainable that have been introduced over the past year are simply relabeling a different strategy that existed. That's not enough in our view. This is why we need these skilled managers. So we have a little more time. I want to ask you each one more question. And John, uh, again, reading and watching a lot of stuff that you've put out there, you talk about infrastructure. So when people hear the word infrastructure, they think about fixing our potholes and fixing our airport so LaGuardia doesn't look like you're flying into a third world country or, or other physical infrastructure. But I think the pandemic has crystallized in people's mind even more the need to ramp up our investment in digital infrastructure. What would that do uh, you know, you could look at it through an ESG lens, but what would that do for our country from an environmental, from a societal perspective and, and our ability to improve governance, frankly, if we invested very heavily in giving everybody fast internet and access to tools in the United States? Well, it matters, you bet. And um, I think two things to think about on the kind of infrastructure that you're talking about, uh, to the extent that, as I use the term transparency earlier, to the extent that we can create transparency, it really helps you get to facts. It helps you get to the truth. Um, it eliminates the potential for greenwashing. It puts reality sort of in everybody's, um, the palm of everybody's hand. So if we can build um, an information system that can create transparency and people can really understand what we're doing, why it matters and where the solutions are, uh, I think we'll be much more likely to get to the economic structure that we need you know, to make these changes. But you also talked about um, kind of equality, right? Getting that big broadband pipe, um, getting access to that information to everybody. Um, and this is an area that is extremely important for us to um, solve the inequality challenges that we have. We know that inequality in one form starts because of lack of access to opportunity, um, access to learning, access to information, access to finance. Um, and, and if we can use our knowledge and our growing ability to manage and distribute real information and data and democratize that entirely, I think we can make significant progress towards um, giving everybody the opportunity to be included in this capitalist system, in this society. Uh, so it's, a, it's an important step. But I would just go back to what I said earlier. Um, even though companies have become overwhelmingly powerful relative to government and relative to all of our other governing institutions like the big NGOs, even though that's happened, we need government to come through for us, not necessarily with big fiscal spending plans or um, pulling the levers on the monetary system. We need real regulation that will be helpful to create the incentives within our capitalist system so we can solve these problems. So in addition to building that digital infrastructure that we're talking about, we need the government to play its role and assure that the information is accurate it's helpful in that we get the incentive structures aligned so your generation can have the great opportunities that ours has had. Absolutely. Erica, how do you look at technology, fintech, decentralized finance and ways that we can use technology to improve what John is talking about, the transparency and the reliability of data and information? 
Well, I mean, like John said, critically important. And I have to say something, and I think Anthony will like this, but um, Winston Churchill said that we build our buildings and thereafter they build us, right? So he's standing in front of parliament after World War II. And, he's looking. and I think that's really, really interesting because what that says is, you know, it, it shapes us. When we put an infrastructure in place, it really does shape us. And again, I like, and John likes to use that term access. But, you know, if people don't have access to good data, high-speed data, it, it changes everything. Access to health, access to education, access to good jobs. It's so critically important that we build this infrastructure. And when we think about technology and the infrastructure around technology, we do have to think about the system, right? I mean, we haven't had a proper public dialogue yet about data privacy. We really haven't. You know, we've just scratched it. We have to have that discussion. Again, it's about infrastructure. And if we want to bring that discussion over to the investment uh, decisions in the public markets, well, we have to start thinking about companies. And here is where we go back to governance. And then we have to think about which business models, which companies engender trust, right? Because the idea of trust in the context of data privacy and an IT infrastructure critically important. So the reason I talk about that is just because this is so integral to everything we want to do. And, you know, for, for, for Cornerstone, well, now Pathstone, for Pathstone to think about, you know, our access impact framework to measure impact. Well, the idea of, of measuring access, we need AI to do that. And ultimately, we need quantum computing to do that. And if the U.S. is spending a tiny fraction on developing quantum computing versus China and the rest of the world, we are screwed in, in terms of infrastructure. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of everything. Yeah. Yeah, well, I can tell you firsthand from our SALT conferences, so many uh, large investment allocators that come to our conference and engage in our SALT talks, ESG, impact sustainability, is at the forefront of their minds. So in terms of themes that we cover at our events and on our on our talks, you know, ESG pervades everything that we do. So we're very hopeful that we can have you guys at, at one of our live events here in the near future as soon as it's safe uh, to do so, uh, hopefully later this year. But thank you so much again for joining us. Anthony, you have a final parting word for uh, John and Erica before we let them go? Mute. This is, this is why the millennial took over the conversation, John, as Anthony doesn't even know how to unmute a computer. You know? I muted it because my kids are coming through the door and I've had those moments on live television in which I was trying to avoid Mr. Millennial. But in all seriousness, to continue the great work and, and continue raising the awareness of what is going on. And, and frankly, you talk about the situation, Ta Naisi Coates, uh, wrote an amazing book last year. He said in 1860, the property value of all of the slaves was 3 billion US dollars. And that was $1860. And of course, that was the largest amount of property in the society at that time. So I just want you to take that and digest that for a moment in terms of understanding where the issues and where the consequences are, not just for the United States, but for the world as we push more awareness and we push more progress uh, as it relates to social and racial justice and also uh, the environment. You know, and we have to do this whether we like it or not. If we love our children and our grandchildren and our potential children, we have to continue to do this. So I appreciate everything you guys are doing. And thank you very much for joining us on SALT Talks. And, uh, and since there's a lots of white males in the employment population, John, I'm sure you're updating your resume. I just want to make sure that you keep that yeah. fresh. I, I, I'm not going to pretend to be persecuted as a, a white Anglo-Saxon male in our society. So I appreciate your continued employment, Anthony. Okay. Just want to make sure. Keep you on your toes, Darcy. Absolutely. Thanks again, guys, for joining us. Uh, thanks, you guys. It's a pleasure. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to today's SALT Talk on ESG Investing. Just a reminder, if you missed any part of this episode or any of our previous episodes, you can access our entire archive of SALT Talks on our website and our YouTube channel at salt.org backslash talks. And our YouTube channel is called SALT Tube. 
We're also on social media. Please follow us on Twitter is where we're most active at Salt Conference. But we're also on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook as well. And please tell your friends about Salt Talks. We love growing our community and, and providing people access to these educational resources. Uh, everything's for free, again, on our website and our YouTube channel. And on behalf of Anthony and the entire SALT team, this is John Darcy signing off from SALT Talks for today. We hope to see you back here soon.